Welcome back, everyone, to East Coast DNA. Uh, some people may have noticed I've been a little adventurous this year and have been uh, popping outside the the regular realm of uh, some of the geographic location of our artists. But I had uh, already in the past and always intended to expand my definition of East Coast to include Quebec, uh, mainly because of the uh, French and English connection through New Brunswick that uh, includes our East Coast region typically. But uh, today we have a Montreal-based artist. Uh, welcome, Brandon. We have Brandon here from uh, yesterday's. Hello. Thank you for having me. So, uh, Brandon, the, your last name was uh, curious to me. Uh, McShad, is it? Yeah. What's the origins of a name like that? I, I don't do this all the time, but the the uh, Nova Scotia has a lot of, uh, I guess, European descent here. So a lot of the surnames that pop up around here are quite common around here too. I've not heard right. yours before. So yeah, um, my name is actually so this is this is the first time I'll ever have said it in an interview. But my name's actually fake. Like it is legally my name, but my dad changed his name when he came to Canada. <laughs> that's not um, so, unusual it's just yeah. not no exactly spoken about right exactly yeah and that's the thing so like i'm half italian on my mom's side and then i'm half iranian uh so that's it so my mom's okay. full italian from italy she came in like 67 um and then my dad came in the i think mid to late 80s um okay. but his original his original last name because he's from iran then lived in spain and then lived in montreal since uh, it was originally Amjadi Shad, so that's where the Shad comes from. Ah. Uh, but then he changed it to Mick Shad to possibly avoid any issues in the future, and uh, it's a good thing he did. Yeah, because, yeah. Uh, I've traveled enough with friends that aren't uh, don't have the whitest last names, and uh, it could be interesting sometimes crossing the border. So. <laughs> well, I'm sure, I'm sure. It yeah. Could. yeah, I'm. I'm glad I didn't phrase it the original way I did. People that know me a little closer, when uh, when I hear a name that's new to me, I usually say that's a fake name. So mm -hmm. I was going to start off with a variation of that as a question. I'm like, yeah, I don't know this guy yet. I probably should not do that. So I'm, I'm glad it's I went good. the way I did. Yeah, no, it's cool. And it's it's nice for once to talk about it because like usually only like people I'm close with I've told, but yeah, it's not normally a question I get asked. It's also rare that people even bring up my last name. So it's cool. <laughs> Thanks. No, there you go. So uh, another question I had too, I went back and I'm going to just reveal a little behind the curtains here for uh, how I do my research. Uh, when I was going through your YouTube channel, I saw that you actually had an 11 minute interview on there from it's a few years old now. Uh, you guys made it yourself where you had like a 10 questions thing. Oh yes. Yes. Yeah. Oh my God. It's very old. <laughs> yeah. So being that it is very old, I didn't take a lot of that as like news and information about the band. But I am curious, there was only three of you in that video. Was there only three people in the band at the time? Did you not have a bass player? So, yeah. So for like pretty much almost the entire time we've existed, we've been three. Um, yeah. And then because at the time, too, we were mainly just recording and playing live. It was fine. But then I would say once the second EP was basically fully done, um, Matt, our drummer, was like, yeah, we need more guitars live, which is valid because like I'm good. I'm a good rhythm player. But like, again, end of the day, it comes down to the wall of sound that we had in studio. Mm -hmm. Didn't really translate well live. Like it, we did the best we could. You know, we'd have big amps and, you know, you could push as many pedals on as you want. But end of the day, if the room isn't for it, it's not going to sound good. And also, even if you're one guitar through two amps, it's still going to sound like one guitar. You know, what I mean, it's never going to have that same effect of stacking parts um so he brought that up and then um one of our friends uh, offered to fill in for now he's like let's try it out I'll, I'll fill in with you guys until you feel like you need to find someone else and so he played with us but we liked it and we had chemistry so we're like yo you can stay in the band uh um, awesome. so yeah that's how we got him but uh at that point the ep was already done so like he didn't really play on it like he played i think one part on guitar not even on bass okay um and it, that's kind of how we work in studio it's whoever can play the part most efficiently uh, for studio time purposes, uh, we'll usually go. So like some songs I'll play guitar and Zach won't play anything at all. Um, sometimes the other way around, depending on it. Cause again, I have a specific feel and then Zach has a tighter feel cause he comes from like the school of metal. So he sure. tends to be very tight to things Whereas I'm, I was a drummer first. So even though I'm, I can be tight, I'm not, I'm more of a feel guy versus a 
let's be as tight as accurately possible. If it sounds good and it feels good, that's usually how I roll. But, you know, for studio, you always want to have the best possible take. So sometimes we'll, we'll go back and forth. Sometimes it'll be both of us, depending on the part. Um, but yeah, the, we're credit, we're all credited for kind of the same thing. There's no egos in the room at that point, you know? Um, but yeah, so at the time we were three people, uh, Zach was on bass. I was on guitar and vocals and Matt's on drums. Uh, and it kept going that way. And then we got a fourth member, but he identified himself more as like what Mike white, I think it's Mike white, his name. I don't remember his name. The dude from green day who like plays the second guitar okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. that he like tours with them, but he was never really like, he was very, very little part of the band at one point like he was actually like a, a member but for the most part he was just there to play live same thing with muse they have like a fourth guy who plays like keys and guitar parts behind the scenes so it was kind of that thing he's like i don't need any writing credits um i don't have to be in the stuff you guys do like interviews or videos unless you know i feel like i want to be in them um he's like i'm okay if you guys just want to still run as a three piece and that's it because core of the band in the day is us three um, and right now we're kind of in the same spot. So he, he unfortunately left, but, um, we're still on good terms. It's just, he's no longer playing with us. Yeah. So we have another friend filling in. So we're kind of probably going to keep going that kind of route where it's like, it'll always be us three and then we'll see who plays with us live. But, um, yeah. So where did the core Trinity of the band begin? Like, are you guys yeah. all acquainted to like, growing up in the area or how did that come about yeah so um we all went to the same high school i was a grade above zach and matt um me and zach used to play together when i was a drummer um he used to play with one of my friends who was a guitarist we used to jam together and that's where our history kind of started um and then him and matt used to play together but we never played all three of us together but we each had our own kind of chemistry with one another um eventually i started writing my own songs and uh i recorded and played everything in studio but like live it's kind of hard to do that and i didn't want to be a backing track artist so yeah not that there's anything wrong with that it just I, I find as a solo act in a club with nothing else unless you're like a dancer or like a really good stage presence kind of person doesn't really translate well so i really wanted a band so i i got zach we got another friend who was a drummer who i did play with at one point in high school didn't really work um he just wasn't into it in the end and also it just wasn't tight sounding like we really pride ourselves on our live show and even back then when we were just starting we kind of wanted to have a tight live show um so zach brought in matt and uh matt's great <laughs> matt's probably like the in my opinion the greatest drummer i've ever played with <laughs> and awesome. uh, honestly it's was probably the dude that we i say besides you know getting complimented on our live show the the biggest thing we get often is how good of a drummer matt is <laughs> um to the point that like even other bands or even other people in the crowd are like dude your drummer is ridiculous and we're like yeah we know <laughs> but like he's just super humble and like super quiet that like it doesn't come off that way. like you see him come on he always wears this golf hat because he, he's a golfer um but he always wears that damn hat and like you see this kid you would never he looks like a dad you would never think yeah. he's the drummer that he is but he could play gojira better than like anyone besides mario um and then he'll go on and play our stuff like perfectly and like add these fills and just be super on the ball and then everyone's always like, the hell is that? And I'm like, that's Matt. That's our, that's our boy, Matt. <laughs> so that's how the core kind of started. And then we transitioned to yesterday's. So just because we were all writing together and there was just no point to keep running under my name for, you know, yeah. however couple of many shows we played. So we just transitioned basically right away. <laughs> now your early material, you just mentioned Gorgera in passing during that yeah. and and in that old segment on your youtube channel you guys mentioned a lot of your influences and i do know that aside from of some of your pop sensibilities that for the most part the common connective tissue in influences across the the three of you was quite heavier than maybe what the majority of your songs sound like yeah. Uh, but not all. I I will say that I went back to the beginning too and listened, and I did like other side was just mind blowing with the visual too for the video. So yeah. I, I I recommend anyone that likes the heavier tunes to go check that out. Give yourself a few minutes to watch the video. <laughs> but I did notice that as you have matured as a band, and even in your press release and bio it, it mentions about the maturity of the band being reflected a lot with the lyrics and your own personal experiences uh, with mental health and with relationships so i'm curious 
is there influences outside of the heavier music that have been added in in between the two eps or and this is kind of a leading question but this, this is where i'm hoping you're going to go or is it maybe some of the other artists that you've performed with over the last couple of years in between eps um no the artists we perform with it's usually sometimes we'll like borrow from them in terms of like live kind of like how to work a crowd or stuff like mm -hmm. that or also just kind of knowing your place sometimes like you always want to steal the show if you're an opener and stuff, but also you don't want to be like, I don't know if I'm, a, can I swear on here or not? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Feel free. Okay, cool. You don't want to be a dick either. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. obviously, yes, leave it all on the stage, but don't come off like you're the main act either. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, we played with some people who like don't either they overstay their welcome in terms of like playing too long and stuff like that. Um, not necessarily at our shows, but like shows where we've done showcases and stuff yeah. like that, where it's like you're set to get on and get off as quick as possible now's not the time to be a diva because everyone's watching and seeing how professional you can be. So yeah. that kind of happened at Canadian music week. One of the bands we played with, she was an artist right before us at one of the shows, like spilled water on stage and like, was like, Oh, Dory, my band's going to clean it up like into the mic and then dipped. And they actually had no choice but to clean it. And I was like, that, like, what's your problem? Like you can't just clean up this. It takes two seconds to take a paper towel and just pick up the water. Like, yeah, I don't get it. So yeah, definitely. I don't borrow from people in terms of our songs. <laughs> um, yeah. I'm super ADHD at the same time with music. So I'll get super obsessive with a band for like a good six months or less and kind of borrow uh, a lot. Cause I, I like to think of myself as a vacuum or a sponge, um, sure. but without directly ripping people off, you know what I mean? So like, I won't hear a song be like, I should write a song like that. Cause I find that's something a lot of artists are doing now is like, you know, Dua Lipa is killing it right now. And like, she keeps always changing it a bit and everyone's trying to be Dua Lipa now. And it's like, yeah, it's cool, but there's already a Dua Lipa. We don't need another Dua Lipa. <laughs> right. So, Saturation so, can be a big problem. Yeah. And then also you're kind of dating yourself too at that point, because by the time you're doing it, it's already kind of starting to pass because people have already been listening to that for so long that like, eh, I kind of want something new now. You know what I mean? Like I get obsessive with bands. I might get bored after a while that if I hear another band like it, it's not really going to scratch the same itch as if it did if I mm -hmm. listened to it six months ago. So throughout the first EP to this EP, I went from, like again, the same influences we always had, Royal Blood, Muse, uh, Foo Fighters. Um, but I started getting super into grunge, which is like reflective in songs like Hanging by a Thread, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> like that's my kind of ode to like Soundgarden uh, without trying to, because I can do a decent impression of Chris Cornell, but like I'm also not Chris Cornell, so I'm not going to start doing the exact same delivery as him. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. So, but Chris also writes a lot about mental health in his songs. Like basically a lot of grunge acts did that, but Chris especially was really, I'd like to say more of a poet than some of the other ones at the time. So I really borrowed a lot from him, um, especially for that. That's lyrically and vocally probably my, my favorite song we've worked on uh, just because despite it being five minutes, I, it tells a story. It's really well said. It's just a really well orchestrated song. Um, but like, then after that, I got into Jeff Buckley and I went on this Jeff Buckley kind of binge for a while and we don't make anything that sounds like Jeff Buckley, but I started to get more into, you know, how to use my voice without busting it and how to, you know, have emotion in your voice or in your lyrics without it being, you know, either on the nose or sometimes, you know, I find you could almost go the opposite direction where it's like too deep, where like, there's just no meaning almost. It just sounds like nothing. Yeah. So it's kind of that thing. So I start to understand more about how to use lyrics and like, you could be literal sometimes and that's more than enough. And sometimes you could be figurative enough where it's, it works, but it's not like pretentious almost, you know what I mean? So like in one of our songs going nowhere, which is about like my suicide attempt, I'm borrowing from actually um, a poem I read in class when I was in college, like now it's like eight years ago. Um, and I, I don't remember, I think the poet's name was Seamus something. He's like kind of a legendary poet. I'm horrible with this stuff, mm -hmm. but he had a poem called Digging. And it was really about how his life, he had, you know, lived on a farm and he, he would talk about his dad, his grandfather and he, how they would be digging and how he kind of broke that tradition. And now he's a poet and he's digging with his pen. So it's kind of a cool, it's really well written the way he does it. Mine kind of sounds like whatever, but I borrowed that exact thing. So like, you know, pen in hand seems I'm digging my own grave today. So kind of my suicide letter. And, you know, going towards where I was going. Um, so, you know, little things like that, that I brought from like, again, it was a history lesson in poetry class like years ago. <laughs> so I kind of, again, I take from everything. Um, right now I'm on like a huge Queens of the Stone Age kick. So like, who knows, maybe our next stuff's going to have a bit more wacky, 
kind of tones or just even a bit heavier kind of tones. Um, I've been listening to a lot of Super Heaven. I don't know if you're familiar with them. They were kind of a band that's kind of popped off a bit recently because of TikTok because they had one song that became a meme. But that's really one good. I'll check out. I'll have to check that yeah. one out. It's new to me. They're they're cool. They're very you can tell the grunge influences there, but it's just the way their songs have like this massive wall of sound. I've been really borrowing from that and these weird chords sometimes. Again, I'm a drummer, so I don't know what the hell I'm doing. So if it sounds good on guitar, I kind of run with that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, to kind of yeah, I go all over the place with my my answer sometimes. But yeah, essentially I borrow a lot from whatever I'm listening to at the time. Um, but I'll never force it. So like the Jeff Buckley thing, I never, you know, came to studio and be like, this song's too heavy. Let's go for something a bit more calm or sure. something, you know what I mean? <laughs> so, and like our song, Holy Moly, This Is Who I Am, started in a practice, but like I was super into the Dirty No, um, which, you know, they're still not a massive band, but like they became a big influence to me. And actually me and Zach really liked them a lot. So mm -hmm. when I was writing that one with Matt, because we jammed it, I was like, all I had in my head was, this has got like a dirty nail feel to it. Um, but it also kind of has a big rec feel to it in a way, which is another mm -hmm. band we really, really like. Um, and big rec, even though, you know, we really like them, there's nothing we've done that's too, too influenced by big rec, aside from our production. So yeah. big rec's got massive sounds and everything always sounds huge and just like a brick. Like, so we kind of did that kind of thing. So even though we won't be trying to write, you know, that song or anything like that, like it still has that you listen to our songs and despite us being still small and independent, they don't sound like songs a normal small independent band would put out. Because right. We spent so much time in studio trying to make sure they sound huge. <laughs> so. But one yeah. of the things I noticed too, like I, I, I'm aware of a few of those influences. So I was kind of listening with a little bit of an ear to try to pick out where some of those influences were in the individual songs, but more specifically with the new EP too. And the reason I had the question about uh, bass, I, I've noticed like there's a real thick, heavy bass underlaying pretty much every track all the way through with that. But like it's, it it definitely is showcasing that you have uh, some heavier influences in there, like because maybe like in the seventies, like Black Sabbath or something was doing that. But to your point, a lot of the newer like indie rock bands that's not necessarily the sound. So you do have a unique blend of your influences yeah. there for sure. Now, one thing in with that too, and I kind of. Uh, mentioned at the beginning of the episode too from a curiosity point of view you're in montreal so i'm curious as an english speaker are you bilingual yeah yeah i i, I speak french and just i'm not the best french speaker but i sure. i can i can get away with it like i work i'm actually at work right now just it's done but i'm using one of the offices yeah um but i work at a music store i mean long mcquade like uh, okay you guys have those too i work yeah, there, yeah. so i work at the one in our area so um but uh yeah and we have a lot of french speakers that come here but it's not like i i was horrible at french basically like 90 percent of my life so far so like up until i started working barely could speak like i spoke what i needed to for class and that's where it ended but like now that i work here uh, or work here now that i work in general <laughs> you have to kind of speak french because there's still a lot of french speakers coming in yes um but yeah to navigate the scene it's always a touchy subject because some people will disagree and like some people would agree. It's always, you're always going to hear different stories. So I personally find that sometimes you have a bit more of an advantage when you're in a, like a French band, because just naturally they want to, there's still that whole kind of divide of the English versus French, unfortunately, in some cases, especially outside of Montreal, Montreal's mm -hmm. pretty, pretty, you know, like multilingual, but there's still some people that are super like, well, I'd rather have a French band. So even if the band sings in English, they will still book, the french speaking english singing yeah, yeah. band over the english speaking english singing band um and some people will probably say it's not true but like we've literally seen it because we tried to get a gig once in like quebec city and we were shut down but then people we knew ended up playing that same gig and the only difference is they spoke in french but sang in english and i was like yeah. well <laughs> like you're not really helping your case because they're like we're looking for local like you know quebec city kind and we're like okay fair enough no worries and then we find out who's opening. We're like, okay, well then, you know, we could have just said that. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I suspect without knowing the specific venue or anything, I suspect that it's probably people that are taking some uh, old opinions with the language laws and kind of over time, their definition of the boundaries of the language laws is this is the way it is versus what it actually is. So yeah. they probably added their own regulations 
just to yeah, kind of make it more. And like the kicker was like the band that we would have been opening for anyway was the Beaches. So oh, it's yeah. like, dude, they're from Toronto and they're gonna speak English. Like the most they're gonna say is bonjour and merci. So like, what yeah. difference did it make if we opened? <laughs> exactly. Because like, even if we spoke English, people would have just assumed, oh, maybe they're not from here. Maybe they're touring with the Beaches, so therefore English. Like, sure, yeah. You know what I mean? So, and even then, we're not saying anything crazy. We're just saying the usual, how's everyone doing? And like, we're, we're yesterday's and this, 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 and that. Mm -hmm. Nothing complicated. We're not telling a story where it's like, oh, fair enough. Yeah. Maybe I want a French speaking band. <laughs> it's like two minutes of talking total for the set. So, like, yeah. Wouldn't have been a big deal. But yeah, stuff like that happens. And the biggest thing I notice is communication between provinces. So, like, what well, provinces? Between Quebec and the rest of Canada. So, like, I've noticed with some, I've even heard this from other bands that are kind of bigger than us in the province where it's like, you could be massive in Montreal and have like this huge effect right now on the province, but like, because they're French speaking, they won't really communicate with anywhere else in the country. So you're starting from scratch the moment you cross that border. Yeah. Whereas like, if you're from Toronto or something, yeah, you might still be a bunch of nobodies when you come to, to Montreal. But like, if you're already kind of popping off, you still have a bit of a name kind of here, even though that's again, way less then you know you would like it to be like i saw arkells a few years ago uh around the time of their album rally cry um they came here and they played a venue called mtelis which is about like yeah two three thousand people you could fit but that same tour they played scotia bank arena in toronto which is like twenty thousand or a bit less than that and like that's the thing is like they're massive in toronto and they're massive everywhere else in canada but in quebec because of the language and also because we only have one radio station for rock. They didn't really fit into that same category. So then that's all they have is just word of mouth and social media. So, yeah. Th that would explain something kind of interesting. Don't go Google yeah. it because I don't want you to see how long ago it was. But that same area, it used to be the Metropolis, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I saw Chris Cornell uh... do a performance <laughs> at the Metropolis. But like I said, it was it was a while ago now. But uh, I did find it funny that it was a Sunday evening. So, yeah. I mean, I'm sure it's just where he squeezed it in on his tour. But I did find it funny that it, like that was the venue where I was seeing Chris Cornell. Because by the time he was doing solo stuff, like he already had Audio Slave and Soundgarden. And like, exactly. His, his set list was just mind melting. So yeah. I, I, I definitely know that area. Uh, but that's an interesting perspective that I never considered about why there would be such big names at a smaller ish venue. I say ish because a lot of the communities down here don't have venues that big. Yeah. So I'm curious, did any of the French bleed in with your lyrics then? Or is it pretty For much one your... song? Cause it was a joke. Like it's really dumb because grammatically it's actually incorrect. Like Zach's French. He's perfectly bilingual like if you spoke to him you would never think he's french yeah. um, until he speaks french but like we went to the same high school and he's never had the accent or anything he always sounded the same as us um so the song backseat bingo from our first ep has a couple lyrics in french and it's really just because when i wrote that song i was playing more into the front man that's like a little more um flamboyant and like super out there in a way and like trying to you know oh i want all attention on me so the lyrically like the lyrics had that kind of vibe and then in french i was like huh, it could be funny because it rhymes with the lyrics before it but it's in french so like it kind of you know people here might find it cool and then when we recorded it zach's like yeah grammatically they're incorrect though so i was like no one's gonna know like to be fair most of the people won't pay attention to that because a lot of people don't pay attention to the lyrics sometimes and don't realize what they're hearing sometimes you know so sure. It did bleed into it only for that song, but like we would never do like some people we knew who did songs in both English and French so they can go to two different radio markets. Like I love Montreal, but like we're an English band and we're kind of aiming for international kind of, you know, not necessarily fame, but international kind of. Those are your audiences. Is like Yeah, your, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Like even like right now we have a lot of people listening in Europe and they're not primarily English speaking countries, but like, it's fine. Like most of the bands they're going to go see aren't, aren't, you know, German or French or whatever. Like they're used to that. Cause that's the universal language is, is English. <laughs> so, <laughs> I like to think that. So that's it. So we, we really don't want to, you know, make people think, Oh, cause we're from Montreal automatically French barely speak English and, you know, only doing English just to have a bit more success. It's like, we're just an English band. Cause there's a small area here called the West Island, uh, which is like a suburban area in Montreal. That's super English that's where we all grew up <laughs> so, okay yeah like that's the thing so 
in Montreal, it makes sense outside. Like when I go to Toronto, uh, like for CMW, so many people yeah. are from Montreal. You don't sound French, but like these are people who haven't been to Montreal clearly, so they don't realize that it's a lot more English than they think. Yeah. Um, especially Montreal. Like it's one thing if you say, "Oh, I've been to Quebec," it was French. Yeah, because Quebec City is French, but Montreal is pretty fifty-fifty. And depending where you are, it'll be like seventy thirty or even more. So. Yeah, in my limited experience being there, I did notice like people are pretty quick to flip over to English if it's in, the second they hear me speak they're like oh yeah sorry oh, <laughs> right, yeah. yeah so I do know that you have a performance coming up this weekend but that's as of the recording not as of people listening mm -hmm. so I'm curious do you have any plans coming up for this summer for live performances that anybody could actually catch uh, working on it. Like we did try to get out to, to Nova Scotia and Newfoundland and stuff like that. We applied to some festivals around there, but, uh, nothing, unfortunately, um, which is, it's normal. We're still starting out. Right. So like, yep. it's okay. It just means not now. So, right. um, but we do have a gig coming up in Kingston slash Odessa because it's essentially the same place, <laughs> but, uh, we're playing a festival out there in August. Um, but besides that, yeah, we just have our release show. Um, we do get added sometimes to opening slots. So like this would probably change by the time that, you know, not right. that this is out, but like in a couple weeks, a month or so, like we might mm -hmm. be playing a bit more in July or even August and September. So nothing for sure yet, but we've, we've played a few gigs with, uh, with Moto live and they've gone on some, some nice shows before. Like we played with Bleaker recently. Uh, we played for another band called Hotel Mira in February. Mm -hmm. and that was a really fun show as well. Um, so that's it. We never know we're, it's kind of like we're, we're on call for the opening gigs sometimes. So we might have more gigs. We might get out to, 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 you know, Nova Scotia before we know it, but yeah we'll see <laughs> well definitely if you end up making it down this way uh let me know and uh maybe we'll get the rest of the guys in on a little interview in person if you actually make sure. it close enough that we can meet up yeah. I, I do plan at some point on making it to more provinces i still have to cross off newfoundland for my east coast area but uh obviously quebec will be the next one up so I am curious outside of all of that too, your album or the EP that you just released. So it's nothing perfectly. Yep. And that's for the majority of the conversation about music, we were talking about those tracks. Uh, yeah. We did reference a few of the older ones, but for the most part, they were all from that new EP. Can yep. people buy that? Is there a physical copy of it? or is it... Yeah, on our website, you can buy it. So we have like our shop and you can buy like t-shirt, hoodie, tote and the CD. Um, I think both CDs are still on there. I think even our first EP is on there as well. Awesome. Um, so yeah, the first EP, if you buy it, it's super DIY because we got the sleeves made and then we just like wrote with a Sharpie on the CD That's and fun. burned them ourselves and stuff like that. Um, but the second one was actually like printed at, a, at an actual like plant. So this time it's cool. It's like super high quality not that our first one wasn't but like there's a difference in the sound for sure and it's kind of cool because like if you have that kind of thing where your car tells you like the name of the songs and stuff it pops up that it says the artist oh, name cool. and stuff so it's actually really cool like i was pretty hyped about it to be honest so <laughs> yeah so i'm wondering too the website uh, is yeah. there the naming of it you're gonna have to tell people the website yeah. because yeah. yesterday's despite the fact that there's a logo on the screen and people can see that now it's spelt different than it sounds. Yeah. So Y E S T E R for yester and then D A Z E. So yesterday's is one word for the website, but yeah, with a dash actually, is it with a dash? Yeah. On there the dash, yester dash days.com. All right. Perfect. Cause it is yeah. a space in there for the actual band. Name yeah, too. exactly. Yeah. And where did that name come from? um when we were trying to transition from like solo to full band um we were throwing around names and like at this time everyone's name already exists kind of thing <laughs> so it's really a, either a territory thing or because obviously if you're never going to go to australia it doesn't matter if you have the same name as an australian band that's equally if not smaller than you because mm -hmm. you could actually look it up to see if these band names exist on like specific websites and it'll show like oh there's a history of a band that had it but it'll say like active or inactive so like you can get away with it sometimes us, when we got our name, there was no one else with that name. Now mm -hmm. there's a band that has a similar name, but it's not the same way either. So, like, you could still find us. Like, the moment you write Yester, Yester Space Days, like, rock band, or just Yester Days in general, you'll see us. So, yeah. we still appear first, because also we've been around longer. So, like, regardless, it's our name. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> yeah, but the name came from uh, our drummer had a longer name. I think it was, like, Yesterday's Mirage or something. It was, like, way longer. The meaning was cool because about like how you know an ode to the past but like how it feels like we're living in a 
a weird future and stuff like that. Um, and uh, I was like, yeah, it's cool, but it's way too long. So <laughs> I got rid of the Mirage part and I, I rephrased the way it was spelled kind of thing. Um, and I was like, it kind of still had the same thing, like days, like Rena days and, you know, yesterday mm-hmm. like, oh, to the past. So it worked. And then I thought, cause I'm super, I'm a dreamer. So uh, I was like, well, we need a name that'll be chantable. Cause like, that's the kind of band we're aiming to be is like a festival stadium or like an arena band. You know what I mean? Can't wait to play bigger clubs too. Like we're not trying to, you know, just jump to the next level, but it's like, since I was a kid and I think since all of us were kids, we always looked up to our heroes and thought, Hey, it'd be pretty fucking cool if we could do that one day. <laughs> so that's how we kind of see ourselves as like, you know, we're a stadium band right now in an underground scene. Um, and it's just a matter of time before, you know, people hear it or, you know, come to the shows and are like, damn, this is sick. And then kind of word of mouth gets out and we start playing bigger and bigger shows. Um, but yeah, so I wanted a name that's chantable. So yesterday's is three syllables. It's perfect. So uh, that was it. So we did awesome. the test and it worked. Yeah. So that's how we got the name. <laughs> And lastly, for anyone that's watching this, uh, these interviews, I usually end with a song from the artist that I'm interviewing. So is there something that you would like to put in front of people to kind of showcase what the sound is? Or can you nail it down to one song? Uh, It's hard because that's the thing is like we really like we matured in terms of our sound, but also just we're never going to put out the same song twice kind of thing, you know, like Baxi Bingo was a success for us, but we didn't yeah. rewrite the song. You know what I mean? We didn't do another version of the same song. We kind of just kept writing and going with different directions and trying stuff out. Um, I mean, other side is great. That's, that's become so that song when we dropped it had like no attention. Um, yeah. But then like from live is when people started to really like people who came to see us were like that song you play, that's like, just starts with the bass. Cause that's an opening bass line. Like that song's sick. It's so cool. So we started like, putting it closer and closer to the end and eventually we realized it's such a good closer that like that's just what we end with now yeah um and every time it never misses when we're done that one either if we're packing up or like when we're at the merch booth or whatever people come up like either drunk or just super like sober and they're like that song's fucking sick that last one you played <laughs> it's cool even if people don't know the words they usually look up our stuff on like setlist fm or something and it's there and uh, they find it so other sides definitely one i would say check out because it's it is cool it's different and it kind of blends you know our muse Foo Fighters kind of mm-hmm. influence there. Um, Holy Moly is good for that pop punk kind of itch. If you're really into that kind of like Green Day, some 41, Dirty Nil vibe. Um, but then like Hanging by a Thread is like a song that's actually done really well for us too, because people are like, damn, it's like heavy, but it's not like to the point where it's like, ah, can't listen to this, can't relate to it. It's like kind of accessible enough for everyone. So that's also good. Honestly, the Holy P, I'm pretty, we're really proud of it. Um, it's dynamic, but like every song is kind of, got its own sound but also just good and nothing really feels like filler which is really really something we always aim to do we never want to be that band that's like well we need a 10th song so here it is and it's like kind of forced <laughs> so i'll leave it to you maybe chef's choice whatever you're, you feel like would be the best I'll there you, you go decide. perfect i i love the answer because i was suspecting that maybe he can't really nail it down to one especially yeah. even if i just gave you the new ep like Unless you're really pushing a specific single, sometimes it's hard to nail down. So uh, I am going to end this episode uh, by saying goodbye, but let's keep in touch. I definitely uh, would like to talk to you about some opportunities to meet up with you down this way and vice versa. I'd like to head out your way at some point. Yeah, I know a few people in the area too, so maybe we'll uh, have another chat at some point and see if any of those people are mutual acquaintances, make it a little easier too. And uh, for anyone watching this episode, uh, stick around and now you can listen to
I'm such a mess Take what you want before I start to sing Was it all?